Okay, project one, dent 3027. Uh, we have fabricated uh, two occlusion rims, the upper maxillary occlusion rim with the wax borders and our implant retained strengthener within our lower uh, mandibular occlusion rim. And what we need to do is we need to go now, if you can simulate this articulator, this Hanna articulator as the client, and I'll pretend to be the practitioner of the procedures that should happen in the clinic before they get back to the laboratory. So the dentist will put in the maxillary occlusion rim first, uh, probably have a look at the patient and notice the lip line or the plane of occlusion is off. In order to assess the plane of occlusion parallel to campus plane, which is the allotragus line, they will use a, let's take this pin out for all intents and purposes, we'll tend it to patient. And now the patient can open and close freely with no lower mandibular rim. Uh, the dentist is assessing, you know, the lip line is here. Obviously vertical dimension is huge. Even though we've provided a 22 millimeter average standard occlusion rim, they will go with the uh, Fox plane and then try to see if this plane is not parallel. We don't want to be canting to one side or the other. So they will go with the Fox plane and maybe a little bit of uh, an instrument um, and probably mark something that would say, okay, this is where I want my plane of occlusion to be roughly here because they see the lip line here. They're saying, maybe we can shorten it there. So what does the dentist need? Well, possibly a combination of certain tools, maybe a knife, maybe a rim former, uh, if this is business class, maybe provide your new accounts with a rim former and a $7 knife and show them what it's used for. I mean, I'm sure they'll be grateful. I don't think they got that in uh, dental school, possibly. Maybe a, a Bunsen burner if they don't have or some type of heat source. But without that, it's very difficult to do a bite registrations for this client. Generally speaking, this could be anywhere between 30 minutes to 60 minutes of time clinically. That's two to four units of uh, chair time. If done correctly, we're gonna take three registrations here. Face belt transfer, which is transferring the position of the maxilla to the condyles. A protrusive bite record, which is going to program our articulators our articulators to roughly the correct condylar guidance and a centric relation record at the proper vertical dimension, giving us, uh, for lack of a better term, the bite. Centric relation, a relationship between the upper and the lower um, edentulous uh, ridges in the uh, head or neck of the condyle, in the uppermost, midmost, unrestrained position of the glenoid fossa. I mean, you can always look it up on a wiki, what centric relation is, but this is a relationship between, like where the patient has no vertical stop, they're overclosed without any dentures. As you see, I've taken the pin out. And now I'm asking the patient to go through some uh, exercises, um, um, once I get the lower rim in to determine the freeway space. But right now, what I have to go for is the, uh, go with is the lip line and how much teeth I'm going to, let's say, expose uh, below the lip line at rest. Uh, another easy one would be the midline. So I'm the dentist, I'm gonna mark the midline. I'm gonna mark the canine lines. Again, this is our patient. I probably wouldn't use a knife. I think I would use something a little bit smaller, like an instrument. I'm going to go at him with a, a, a big tenture knife. Uh, and then, again, with the Fox plane, to determine the plane of occlusion parallel to Camper's plane or the Allotragus line. Again, there's no ears or, or zygoma on this uh, simulation. I don't have a skull. But just pretend this articulator is the patient. 
I'm going to put this in the patient's mouth. This comes outside. And we can see if this is parallel to the camper's plane. And if not, then I'll continue to do so. I'm also checking the lip line to see how much teeth I'm going to expose here, the high lip line. So I and also this is going to give me a measurement of my anterior one by six for tooth selection. And also that lip line will give me the length of uh, prosthetic teeth that I'll probably use. Uh, once I'm satisfied with the plane of occlusion, I can introduce the lower rim on top of the implants. And as you can see, the lower rims do not contact each other, even though I roughly did parallel to the base of the model in a two thirds retromolar pad, you can see that there's a big opening here. Even though I provided my occlusion rim at 18 uh, millimeters. So the dentist now uh, go to the rim former, a knife or a heat source of some kind to get some intimate contact of those two rims in centric relation at the proper vertical dimension. Not easy. But it's easier to subtract wax than it is to add, I think. So that's why our 22 is going be a little bit high. And I'm going to ask the patient to go through some phonetic exercises, maybe MMM, Mississippi, Mississauga, getting their lips closed in the letter M, trying to see some freeway space. And naturally, the older the patient, the less freeway space I'll probably um, uh, choose for the patient. We're showing them less teeth. So I'm going to now proceed to get these occlusion rims uh, parallel to each other. The lower I'm making parallel to the upper. The upper was parallel to the plane of occlusion or campus plane that I've dictated parallel to the allotragus line, parallel to the interpupillary line, parallel to campus plane, or it's the same thing as interpupillary line, sorry, synonymous. Uh, to allotragus and campus plane is synonymous. Um, and this is, uh, takes time. It's painstaking. Now, if you get really lucky as a practitioner, these occlusion rooms are spot on. If you want to shorten the bite registration time of the maxilla, you could take a papillometer reading, um, a papillometer reading in advance. And I'll show you that shortly. Let me get these rims approximated a lot closer. Now, naturally, I'm satisfied with the length of my upper one. Uh, I guess for simulating purposes, I'm going to reduce it some more. I apologize. And then I can go back and show less teeth on the upper. Then I'll go back and I'll adjust the lower to get the correct vertical dimension of the upper and lower occlusion rims. Now, in this case, I think I've given you a little less room. It's a little more realistic. Very close now. Now, if this is contoured with labial lip support, which I forgot to mention, obviously I've given a guesstimation of the labial uh, lip support, but the dentist can go and reduce lip support or increase lip support. I'm going to reduce slightly. And yeah, I'll put my midlines back on.
if I don't have the right lip support, then it's going to be difficult for me to assess the bite, class one, two, or three, under um, in centric uh, relation. Is it a class one? Is it a class two? How much overjet am I going to have? Right? So the dentist needs to dictate to the technician, listen, class one, two millimeters overjet, one millimeter overbite, protrusive bite record for the condylar guidance. Now I think I'm going to close it one millimeter more. And now you can imagine with the patient here, it's a lot of back and forth. Inserting this in their mouth each time. A little bit more on the upper. Now we can see there's a vertical dimension on the upper because it was kind of post-operative immediate not too long ago. So it's really imperative in dentures that we receive the occlusion rims in intimate contact, top and bottom. Naturally, being an implant retained lower, this is giving us even more stability in, uh, in the bite registration phase. Just going to reduce a little bit of a high contact there. And luckily, this practitioner has some wax to fill in third quadrant about a quarter millimeter here. So again, this is simulating our patient. If we want to reduce time for occlusion rim, we have something called the papillometer. Uh, this is made by Kendalor, and we can put this in the client's mouth and then say, you know what, papillar meter reading uh, this stays on the incisive papilla, as you can see here, this little rest position. And put that on the incisive papilla. And then I can say how many millimeters. Let's zoom in a little bit here. I'll move the ruler over so you can read it. Uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 millimeters papillometer reading. So the dental technician will put this here and say, okay, he wants 9 or she wants 9 millimeters occlusion rim. And then therefore that occlusion rule will be very close, give or take plus one of what the practitioner is expecting at the bite registration phase, saving some time uh, chair side. Just gonna soften these up just a little bit. And then generally, once you have the centric relation, I would soften the occlusion rims up very gently, usually just one, and then have the patient close in a retreated position and close together. And now we have an intimate contact. At the same time, I'm marking on the patient the midline. The smile line, the canine line. Again, this is the clinical portion of the job. That's going off camera now. You know, this is went to the laboratory, your rims, and your rims now are being simulated, being adjusted at the dental office. Because these are kind of soft here, I've got 100% contact between my rims. I have the patient do some exercises. Mississippi, 66. The S's and the M's. Checking out this freeway space. Everything goes 66. Mississauga, Mississippi. And I'm checking, you know, if they say, Let's say uh, if you want to use like Missouri or Mississauga or Mississippi and they go, and this doesn't open, there's no, Mississippi, I'm like, whoa, no freeway space. That means my vertical dimension would be too high. So I need to open this a bit. Maybe a little too much information for the dental technician, but still we need to know why when our setups are coming back saying reduce vertical dimension, what has happened? So we've got our midline. This is the patient. We've got a canine line, we've got high lip line, we've got vertical dimension, we've got lip support, we've got contour, we've got buckle corridor. It looks like it's going to be a class one. I've checked with the fox plane here, parallel to campers plane, parallel to the allotragus line, or synonymous with the allotragus line, parallel to the interpupillary line. So my setup is not canted. 
Now, what I'm going to do now as the uh, dental, as the uh, clinician, I'm going to remove the lower rim. I'm going to create some keyways into my maxillary rim with no undercuts. Usually two transverse ridges would be you know, roughly standard each way. Many dentists will just inject uh, you know, a, a bite registration material over the rim, but there, we need to have some lock, right? Now this rim has to be stabilized, which it is, it's with those wax borders and the undercuts. Comfortable for the patient, because you can see the patient's got to wear this a long time, a whole half hour or an hour. And I'm sure maybe in your second year class, you'd gone through these procedures clinically, but we need to go over them the correct order or repeat them again for us. So we've got the occlusion rim on the upper in the patient's mouth with two transverse ridges, roughly around the molar region. And now what we're going to do is we're going to, first bite registration is the face bow. And the face bow registration, the face bow registration is going to transfer now, the upper maxilla in relation to the condoms. Now, that face bow registration uh, depends on the face bow being used, should match the articulator system that you have. Stratus being Ivoclar, Hanau being Whip Mix, uh, Candelator being uh, Condolator being uh, Candelator. Uh, Amon Gerbach. Uh, we've got uh, Cavos, uh, Protar articulator, so many semi-adjustable, fully adjustable articulators. Now, I'm going to add some wax here off camera, what I'm doing to the bite fork. Very soft, molten base plate wax to the bite fork, wrapping around the bite fork wax. Soft wax. Having the patient now, probably ahead of time, I would take the occlusion room out of the patient's mouth and I will loot the maxillary member. You can see there's a midline here. And this is a uh, spring bow of Hanau's, kind of an old one. This one might've been mine when I was a student. Um, but I have the others as well. I mean, that's just another contraption. But since we're using the Hanau, We'll stick with it. So there's the face bow on the fork. I'll go into the patient's mouth now. And this fork is sticking out of their mouth. It's kind of a big obtrusive thing here. While it's in their mouth, I will loosely put on this uh, attachment. It's got, th it, it, the universal spring uh, face bow of Ivoclar's is, is one universal arm. This one has three, and they're numbered one, two, three. Uh, I can get the face bow. Maybe I can get out a little, zoom out a little bit. Uh, the face bow is put in the uh, uh, patient's ears. This is the infraorbital notch indicator for Frankfurt Plain or campus plane, depending which one I want to uh, utilize. And then this, uh, or I'll introduce it this way to the patient. I'll attach it to the spring bow first, and then I can keep this actually very loose. Cause I don't know, I don't want to guide them in any position. And then I will put this in a vertical position and then slide it towards the patient, opening the ear pieces, and then putting the ear pieces in the client's ears. At the same time, make sure that this occlusion rim, oh yeah, 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 loosen my pin here. Again, simulation, eh, perfect. in here. There we go. 
And then I will lock the uh, face bow, make sure that this is up in the right position. Passive, everything has to be passive here. I'm missing an air piece on this side. I'll go a little bit further. You know what, I'll take this ear piece off and then that'll equalize both sides because I have one ear piece off on the other side. Then I can get it centered a little bit better. I can choose the plane of this face bow. Again, all it's doing is positioning the maxilla in relation to the condyles, which the ear pieces are in the condyles. And then I'll go and I'll tighten, whoops, number one, number two, and number three. Once I've tightened these, I can release the, the face bow from the patient. Now I'll remove the occlusion rim. I will put my face bow record aside. And then I will move to bite registration number two. I'm gonna reinsert this into the patient's mouth. I'm going to reintroduce the lower. I'm going to notch the lower, probably not in their mouth, on the bench beside. And I have some simulated cases on video or stills that I've done this. Uh, chair side. And this is what we're doing at the side of the room when you see us giving you occlusion room. Room 501 will have a 20 degree condylar guidance. 508, 25, 510, 30, and room 512, a 35 degree condylar guidance. And we're gonna program our articulators this project here. So I need to, no undercuts for the clinician, please. Two nice registration boxes, roughly just opposing that of the upper registration vertices. And then as the practitioner, I will take a uh, wax or putty, but wax is probably a lot more cost effective for us and faster. I'm gonna roll up a good three quarters of a sheet of wax. I'm gonna introduce this uh, roll of wax to the patient. And this is what our clinicians are gonna do in each classroom. And then I'm gonna have the patient bite in a protrusive position and close, but not all the way. And I'm just going to make sure that you can see that the bite is open. This is a protrusive bite record. I've loosened the condyles on my patient. Obviously, I can't loosen the condyles on the patient, but I ask them to bite forward. And I've practiced this position with them before introducing this block of wax in the patient's mouth. Once the uh, wax is set in the mouth, I'll ask them to open, I'll remove the occlusion rims, I'll set aside the protrusive bite record, not too far away from my face bow record, and now I'm on to bite registration number three, which is the last one, which is centric relation record. We can use a putty, we can use a bite registration material,
and I'll inject in the client's mouth the Registeel or bite registration, which is very quick material, sets within 10 seconds. And I'll have them close down in centric relation, guiding them to bite in the appropriate position. Now, this is the most important bite, I think, that the patient is now occluding in uh, centric relation at the right vertical dimension. That vertical dimension was decided with the appropriate lip support and freeway space. And um, how it really decides on how much uh, tooth structure we're going to um, show in the smile line. Once this is done, there's now 45 minutes has passed. Uh, hopefully not 45 minutes on our video here, maybe 25 on our video, we cut it in half. Left the patient to open. And then I use this position as last because these types of registrations in the wax blocks may have been distorted through the protrusive bite record and the facebo record, these little invertices or box cutouts. So I'll leave them till last for the centric relation because I don't want these occlusal uh, records being kind of distorted and I can't find a home base now when I go to mount these. This is our vertical dimension here. Before the patient goes, we can talk about uh, tooth size. We can use a intercanthus measurement, which gives us the width of the one by four. We could give the, another ala measurement, the facial meter, the width of the nose, corresponding to the width of the anterior six, midline canine to midline canine. Uh, we also could use uh, something like this on their face, which is from Densply. And this will go up against the zygoma and you can see seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 here. This will give them the width of the anterior central and this will give the length of the anterior central. Now, this is quite a contraption. Um, but we need to go back into our denture history where dense ply was founded in York, PA by the immigrant from Switzerland, which is Dr. Gysi uh, from the University of Zurich, who had started his, uh, you know, the first semi-adjustable articulator in his phases of occlusion. And then he uh, co-founded TrueBite, which is a subsidiary of dense ply which is creating denture teeth uh, and denture teeth molds, square tapering ovoid. And this is Densply's version of, um, uh, of version of tooth selection at the time. This is the true bite tooth indicator. It's loosely based on uh, uh, Fibonacci numbers, which is the golden rule of uh, ratio where the width of the zygoma divided by 16 will give, it, give us the width of our central, the length of our face, or divided by, under the chin here, divided by 21 will give us the length of our central. And these are loosely based on uh, uh, golden rule of proportion or Vitruvian man. We need to go into our history about uh, da Vinci, uh, and da Vinci's art was based on the Fibonacci numbers and the Fibonacci numbers are um, numbers that, oh, I just got lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Uh, one, three, five, Uh, add and subtract one. So if we started with the, the number uh, zero plus one is one, and then add that with each other from the number preceding it. So one plus one is two. And then one plus two is three. And then three plus four is seven.
4 plus 7, 11. 5 plus 11, 16. So you're adding the two numbers preceding to it. And this is based in nature. Uh, you can do your own research about... Uh, I think they use a lot of pine cones and flowers. And this kind of repeating in nature. A lot of art students would use this proportion or the golden triangle of proportion. And it does have some application in dentistry. So I got off topic there. I apologize. I'm talking about Dr. Gizzi's, uh True Bite, Dense Ply, 20 degree setup. This would be your first year in dental technology with Mr. McCormand talking about 20 degree setup and the compensating curve. And you set up the uppers first with the molars off the plane, the distal occlusal, a uh, distal buccal cusp and number seven, uh, half a millimeter, millimeter, millimeter and a half off the occlusal plane of the upper. And then in second year, we talked about other theories. Uh, we can talk about Dr. Uh, Hildebrand, who is the uh, developer of uh, Vita. Uh, and he adopted uh, uh, lingualized uh, occlusion. And then this year, third year, we're gonna talk about Dr. Gerber. Uh, and that's where these gentlemen were all colleagues, if not replaced each other at the university. Uh, although Dr. Hildebrand was a German and Dr. Gerber and Dr. Gysi Swiss. Um, and I think I said University of Zurich, but I'm in University of Bern, B-E-R-N. Uh, regardless, Dr. Gerber uh, formed uh, Candelar and lingualized occlusion, uh, later purchased from a company in Liechtenstein, which you all know as Ivoclar, and Ivoclar's denture setup of Phanaris, etc. is based on Dr. Gerber's occlusal philosophies. So there you got like a brief history of one, two, three. What we're doing here at George Brown is we expose you to all of them so you know where your practitioner's belief system lies. And in our denture setup, we've used all of them. We can use the papillometer, nothing wrong with it. We can use the face guide of tooth selecting, nothing wrong with it. We can use the intercanthus uh, ruler here by Ivoclar, nothing wrong with it. And we can use the form selector. Now this is an earlier version of Blue Lines Ivoclar's ala meter, the width of the nose. And we can use a henna, we can use a stratus, and we could use a candelator. It's all semi-adjustable articulator. So I'm gonna be returning with the laboratory portion. So that was a, a 30 minutes of the clinical portion, but that could take 30 minutes to an hour to take those three registrations. So we chose the, we gave these measurements, we also would do a shade selection at this time. Age, complexion uh, of the skin for contrast. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, the older our clients get, the less uh, tooth, uh, the less blood flow in the teeth uh, exists. And then we end up with more, let's say, uh, higher value if we go to our ceramics class in our denture tooth color. So a younger patient might be A2, one with higher value, meaning more gray in the tooth, then we would go to a C2. And we can visit uh, Vita's shade guide um, to reinforce that. I mean, this is the classic shade guide here, which is, seems to be industry standard. And we got A123, A3.5, A4, then B1234, C1234, D2, D3, D4. Each one of these is in a different hue, right? We got our A's. We got our B's and we got our C's and we got our D's, okay? And each one of these is a different hue. Meaning, what do I mean by different uh, hue, so to speak? So the A's we can categorize as reddish brown, the base hue. Uh, we've got reddish uh, brown, A, one, two, three, four. Let's zoom in here a little bit. This is very dental technology. It's not so much clinical if they go to the clinic for... Uh... So here we got our, our youthful A123, A3.5, A4. And then in our Bs, the main hue here is reddish yellow. Um, I know it's hard to think that there's red in there, but if we say reddish yellow is the base hue. And then in our Cs now, uh, we have our grays, C1234. The gray, the, the the value is very high here in our C shades. And then including in our D shades, we've got increased value as well. 
where we've got D2, D3, 4. These are reddish gray. So we've got the reddish browns, you've got the reddish yellows, you've got the gray, and you've got the reddish gray. Yeah, they like to use the color red. But this seems to be industry standard. They've departed from this slightly and gone to the 3D shade guide. Let me see if I have one here. Sorry for the delay, but I have many. As a dental technician, you end up collecting all the shade guides necessary. So this one comes in a beautiful presentation, a little fancy package. Let's zoom out here. Still from Vita Shade Guides, and it opens up, and you would start by selecting the base hue first, which is over here on this side. Where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? Is it underneath here? There it is here, it's right on the top. So you will start with zero to one uh, for the base hue, right? You can see your whites. And then once, let's say we decided that we wanted to be in the three range, which is three M2, then we can go and pull out number three here. And then lo and behold, we've broken it down to three M1, three L and a half, three R15, three M2, three L25, R25 and M3. Each changing the value within the same hue. So basically, the basic shade guide broken down even further. Uh, they're similar, but not the same. Some cross reference, some don't. I'll let you postgraduately decide which ones are going to cross reference or not. And that is the 3D shade guide, which is used a lot in the in the fixed prosthodontics. We've got our classic shade guide. We've got uh, uh, True Bites shade guide. Uh, this is my generation, as you can tell by the, the retro 1950s uh, illustrations. And this was even giving us basic stuff by how old is your patient? Are they blonde, redhead, light brunette, medium brunette, or dark brunette? Or will they stay that color if they're... <laughs> Obviously, in the age category, everyone's gray. But let's see what color they're going to stay for the majority of their time. And then their eye color as well. Right? Yeah, hair color and eye color too. And then the eye color. Eye color is not going to change unless you're doing the contacts. And then we would have, this would be your True Light Bio Blend. This is really old stuff, but uh, this is actually still true today if I zoom up. Good stuff. And you can see the, the characterization of these uh, uh, teeth here. You can see the, uh, the staining extrinsically, even though this is built internally. Uh, craze lines, really good looking stuff here from 19... Uh, uh, 60s to the 1980s and whether this is uh, plastic or whether it's a porcelain fired at the, those days uh, but here their shade I think a different number system 100 to 118 so that's kind of a, a antique relic this little uh, box but you know shade guides every tooth system and every porcelain is going to come with its own shade guide so I kind of uh, touched a little bit on shades, touched a little bit on bite registrations, but this is our third year. It's time to culminate everything together uh, and we'll reconvene for the laboratory section.